good morning. Okay. This is Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship. Hopefully the noise is not distracting. I'm going to try and find a couple different things to fix the background white noise. It may be the lights, the lights, um, or the, the hub in here. I don't know that it's picking up that electrical interference. I'm going to try a couple things, see what we can do. Maybe do a microphone setup to um, do or do to do a better audio. Let me know in comments if you can hear me, if there's a buzzing or a white noise or a hissing or something, if the volume's too low. I've got everything turned up. I'm straight to my phone. I don't have a case on it. I'm trying to find out and chase down and troubleshoot what is the problem, what is the issue, because we want to get it fixed. Well, good morning. This is April 30th, and can you imagine four months have already gone by? Four months in this year. I'm giving people a little bit of time to uh, get their notification on Facebook since we uh, record this as Facebook Live and then we transmit it over to uh, YouTube. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, you can go to YouTube and type in Faith and Ampersand Faith and Grace Fellowship. And it should be a, a green box or circle with a white F in it as far as the logo. Faith and Grace Fellowship. We put all of our sermons up there. Do us a favor and subscribe. Click on the subscribe button, it doesn't cost you anything. Click on the like button, the, click on the bell notification so you get notified anytime those, those are up there. And if you would go through each one of the different ones that are up there and click the, the thumbs up button, all of that helps uh, Facebook, not Facebook, but YouTube, say our listeners or, or people watching are actually seeing the videos. Otherwise, they're just there and they don't know. So some kind of activity like that helps. But subscribe first because that helps us out. As soon as we get to a 1,000 subscribers, we can uh, see if we're going to continue on Facebook or just do the YouTube live where it would populate live from there. We have a little more leeway from there, and uh, that would be a, a big help. <clears throat> Our opening scripture this morning, <clears throat> April 30th, 2023, is from Job chapter 19. You don't hear a lot of people uh, preaching or teaching from Job. They say, oh, stay away from that. That's a doom and gloom. That's a, a terrible thing that's happened. But Job chapter 19, 25, in the midst of everything Job was, was experiencing, did, for I know that my Redeemer lives, he shall stand at last on the earth. Job's, Job wasn't looking for a God to serve in the big uh, pie in the sky in the future uh, by and by. He was looking for a God he could serve and he found him. His Redeemer was as physical as the earth and as physical as him. And so the same way when you're going through an issue or a problem, seek the Savior. Spend time with Him. It'll make whatever you're going through so much different. Amen. We lift up a number of people in prayer each week. Rita Hoffman, Kathy Fairley, Keith Wilson's family, Lisa Hunsel, uh, Aunt Darlene, Aunt Jane. Levi and Destiny Miller, I've got something to share with you on that. For Mom Fairley, got a couple of unspoken requests. For Robin, Robin Ballinger, for Steve Rippey, for Mark Fairley, Sam Crabtree, Simone Redbeard. Uh, God is doing things in lives, healings and restorations. And I believe that you are next. God will start doing things in your life 
as I called forth what we called forth these prayer requests each week. God said, where two or more agree as touching any one thing, it shall be done. If we pray according to his will, it will be done. If we pray in the name of Jesus, any ask anything of the Father in my name, I will do it. And we ask for these healings, these deliverances, these restorations, according to the word of God. That God reach into your situation and heal you. Isaiah 53, 5 says that by his stripes we were healed. We are healed. And uh, 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes we were healed. The other part of Isaiah 53 and, and 1 Peter 2 is talking about the crucifixion of, of our Lord. So the crucifixion, the death and resurrection, is tied to the stripes that were applied to his back, tied to that whole event. And healing is part of what Jesus paid for. So we believe in healing, divine health as well, that once he heals you, you stay healthy. Amen? So we pray for those things. We pray for prayer concerns uh, of Israel, the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122, 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper. We love you. Uh, we pray for the workers, for the harvest, for God to lift up and raise up people within churches with a heart and a hunger to parent and disciple other believers. We come against spiritual wickedness in our city, our county, our state, because Missouri and Kansas share a Kansas City metro area. We also pray for the federal region, which covers all of and more than the the uh, the Kansas City metro area. So we're praying for that as well. And the reason we're praying this way is that we have citizenship where we own property and where we reside and where we live. And we're taking authority where we live and then in all the political subdivisions that we live in. We live in a city, we live in a county, we live in a state, we live in the federal region, we live in a nation, and we have representatives that are elected by us and others to our federal government. So we're taking the authority given to us by our legal standing in this world and according to the Word of God. Pray for those needing jobs. I'm still looking for work. I'm still believing in God to give uh, full, full restoration of income. And on top of that, I'm thanking Him already for the job that He's giving me. I'm ready to start work whenever they they turn around and say, we want to choose you, and I'm believing that's going to happen. I'm trusting God in it. So pray with me and believe with me that God's going to give us, according to First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 9, 8, he's the God of more than enough. Not only in our, in our physical bodies that we need uh, grace for, not in our, not in our soul that we need grace for, but even in our income that we need grace for. Because Third John says that he desires for us to prosper and be in health as our soul prospers. If I'm working on my soul, I'm building up my soul, and I know that God is faithful. Amen? So he's not only faithful for me, but for others that need jobs and others that need increased income or decreased outgo or both so we're gonna go to the lord in prayer for all these things if you have a prayer need you want to share with us you can email it to prayer not play it prayers prayer at fgfellowship.org and i'll be happy to pray with you for those and if you want us to share it as one of the ones on here let us know otherwise we'll keep it uh, quiet, but we'll be praying with you and agreeing with you. But if you have a prayer request that we haven't mentioned, and it's on your heart, and you want God to answer, when we're praying here in a minute, you pray with us. You pray, and you ask God for that thing, and we will add our faith and agreement to you for anything that's within God's will and in line with His Word. Amen? And then your faith and our faith together, mixed together, will be Answer. God will answer. Okay, God will answer. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122.6.
We pray for that nation, the people in that nation. We pray for that whole that city, that country, all of their concerns, wherever they may have them. Wherever people live that are named according to the name of Abraham, we pray for their peace and safety. Watch over them and keep them safe, Father. Give them victory in their lives. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, that the answer has not only already happened, but it's even more answers on its way. And Father, we pray for workers for the harvest, people within the church that would be built up, raised up, desire to lead, guide, direct, and parent new believers in the Word, new believers in prayer, new believers in attendance and tithe and what, what you require, and not religion, but how to, to know God in a relationship. Oh, Lord, lead, guide, and direct, and build these, bring these people up, raise them up. Let the church be the church. We bind the spirit of wickedness in this city. According to Matthew 16, you say, whatever is bound on earth shall be bound from heaven, and whatever is loosed on earth shall be loosed from heaven. And Father, we just give you the glory and the honor and the praise that you have already taken care of this. You gave the church the keys to the kingdom, and you spoke this while standing at the, the place called the, the, the gates of hell. You said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we take this authority, and we stand in it in the place that we live, in our city, in our counties, in our state, in our federal region, in our nation, in our federal government, elected officials. We bind the spirit of wickedness that would come against all of our rights as citizens. We bind the spirit of wickedness that would come against the church and all of our abilities to share the gospel and to live in a prosperous society and to meet the needs of the downtrodden, to meet the needs of the brokenhearted. Father, we bind the enemy from usurping authority that's not his and taking over and running over the top of us, we bind it in Jesus' name. And we push it back because you say that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you will raise up a standard against him and he will roll back. And Father, we loose the Holy Spirit according to the same scriptures. We loose prosperity and life and healing and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ into lives, into homes, into communities, into states into the nation, into our nation's government. We pray for revival, Father, in hearts and lives. We pray for the revival fire to spread from shore to shore, boundary to boundary, within and without states, in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, for the answers that are on the way. We pray for those that are looking for jobs that you open the doors that you want them to go through. You provide them everything they need to be sustained through this process of looking for work. And Lord, we pray for those that have jobs or have income that's fixed, that you would increase the income and decrease the outgo miraculously in their lives. That they also have more than enough. They can't work any more hours and add to their income because they're either on a fixed income or on Social Security or on retirement or disability. But Father, increase their income and decrease their outgo. Give them blessings. Stretch where the things aren't supposed to stretch. And I pray for those that are discouraged over job situations. I pray for those that are at their last uh, ounce of strength in trying to find a job. But Father, you would minister. Father, the things that you need to minister to them to give them hope. Because when they have hope, then they can believe. And when they can believe, then they can have faith. But I pray for their hope and increase their believing and increase their faith to stand that you will take care of the situations. I pray for all of these names that we named, Father, that you would lead, guide, and direct them, and heal them. 
I know some that have been in the hospital that are out now. Others have gone for tests and gotten a good report. Others are still in treatments. Father, restore to each one of these. Restore their livelihood. Restore their life. Heal them according to your word. You can't lie. Your word says that you heal. And Jesus, you didn't heal a single person on this earth when you walked this earth that were Christian believers. The church did not exist. You healed hurting, sick, diseased people that needed hope. They needed to see that there was something they could hold on to. Even the woman with the issue of blood had spent many years at the doctors and waste, wasted away all of her money. And then she found her healing in believing in faith in you. Father, I pray for the healings of these bodies. Set them free from these diseases. You became the curse on the cross, Father. Father, Jesus became that curse. The curse has been paid for because Jesus said it is finished. It is finished. No more are we bound to have to be diseased, have to be sick, have to be living in sin, have to be headed for a devil's hell. And I thank you, Lord, for the promise of restoration, not just our soul, but our bodies. And anything that people are praying right now, Father, that is according to your word, that has not been already spoken of, it's according to your word and it's according to your will, I add my faith to theirs according to the word and according to your will. Meet these needs. Meet these needs in a miraculous way. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I almost could have continued to pray for the rest of the hour. <laughs> I know. That's not what you joined up for, but hey. We don't have a relationship if we don't spend time talking with him, right? Every good relationship has got good communication. If you desire to, to give in the offering, you desire to help this work, you can go to fgfellowship.org, fgfellowship.org, and when you go there, you can go to the giving tab, and you can put in your offering. It goes through Tithely. Tithely ends up uh, sending the money to us, and we are able to manage that that way without taking your credit card or your bank information. And I know that we don't meet in a physical place, and so this is this is the virtual offering plate. I also don't require and I don't demand that anybody give anything. It's always a gift of the heart if you desire to give it all. God has blessed us and I thank God for that. And he'll bless you in your giving. Our offering scripture is a little more practical today. It's 1 Peter 4.10 Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. God has gifted all of us with different things. We have talents, uh, artistic, artistic ability. We have talents of being an encourager. Maybe we are, have talents of woodworking or beading or uh, some kind of a uh, graphic arts or something with your hands, something that you do, that you have a gift or an ability. Maybe that gift and ability is you enjoy respecting others and calling them by name and saying, hey man, I appreciate you. That may be your gift. Whatever your gift is, it may be a, a, a gift that shouts to the rooftops and it may be one that's silent. Whatever your gift is, use it to serve others and as you use it to serve others God will take that 
and will bless it. See, giving is not just the, the dollars and cents. Giving is of your time and of you. When we raise our, our children, yes, we shell out money. We take care of the, the clothes. I remember my mom was so frustrated of buying me school clothes. And then when school started, they were already high waters because I shot up in growth over the summer and had to go buy me more. So she always waited until closer to that so that the money she spent was going to at least get some time in school. But the, the point of paying for things, food and clothing and, and roof overhead, that's all well and good, but the things we remember most is the times that they sit down and talk with us. Or the times that Dad, sitting on the, on the couch, playing songs on his guitar and singing. Or uh, driving down the road, going to grandparents, or to Omaha, or, or Ohio, or back from Ohio, or different places. The songs that we sang, the games that we played, I can still sing those songs. If I start singing right now, my sister, my brothers would probably start in. After throwing something at the <laughs> her device because of my voice. But those were gifts. Those, that was serving. And many times we think serving is you have to have an official title. God gives you that gift. He says, whatever gift you receive to serve others. Let's pray over the gifts that have come in this week. And God not only bless the gift as we receive it, but he blesses the giver. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I thank you for every gift that has come in this week. And I praise you, Lord, that this is helping keep this ministry going. You have ministered abundantly above and beyond anything we could ask or think. I pray for the givers, Father that you bless them, pour out a blessing on them that they are not able to contain. And Father, those gifts that they have to give that are not monetary, gifts in the community and to other people, I pray that they try that, they hone that gift, and they do things that will, they can say, wow, that person smiled. Wow, that person said I made their day. Father, whatever their gift is, help them to serve others with that gift this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we lift up the word today, we're going to make our confession. I confess and I declare that this is the word of God. God cannot lie. His word is truth. We accept it, we believe it, we receive it. We live according to grace by faith. The blood of Christ has redeemed us and set us free from sin, sickness, bondage, and separation from God. We are free because of God, Christ's substitute work on the cross. That's pretty free, isn't it? Amen. Our message this morning is titled, Between the Resurrection and Shavuot. Shavuot is the Hebrew word for the festival that happens on the day that we call Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. Shavuot, we'll talk about where it came from and why. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we celebrate as the Resurrection Day or Easter, Oftentimes in church, they just kind of have other services and, and go on and don't do a lot of under, you understanding what the disciples did and how they walked with Christ in those days after the resurrection and before the next big thing on the biblical calendar and in scripture, which we read about in Acts chapter 2, which is the day of Pentecost. And people think the day of Pentecost is just something that happened, but it happened on the day that was a festival, a feast in Israel called Shavuot, which is the day that the Torah was given 
and the day that the Jewish nation was birthed. Amen. So I want you to follow with me in Luke chapter 24, starting with verse 44. Now remember, Jesus has already been crucified, resurrected, and is walking with the disciples. And I don't know if you realize it, but he walked with the disciples for 40 days after his resurrection, teaching them, talking with them. Let's see what he had to say. Luke 24, verse 44 says, Then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins would be preached should be preached in all in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Then in the he led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Father, I ask you to add your anointing to me as I share this message today. Father, not just to me, but anoint the ears of those listening, the eyes of those watching and attending, the hearts of those engulfed in this message today. And I pray that their eyes be enlightened, their ears be open, their hearts be attentive, and that they take this message and mix it with faith, and it's profitable for each one of them individually. In Jesus' name. Like I said, Jesus spent 40 days ministering to and with the disciples after the resurrection. The point of the ascension happened 40 days after. And so what did Jesus have to say and why? Well, in this passage, he says that he let them know that the things that were said in all of the Old Testament, because he explained the, um, let me go back up here, that all these things must be filled which were written in the Law of Moses. That's the Torah, the first five books. The prophets and the Psalms concerning me. The other books, the prophets and the Psalms, including, then there's the, the Kings, the Chronicles, that are, uh, historical works of what happened and so all of these things we're talking about the things in the word pointing to Jesus to the Christ how that he must suffer and rise from the dead the third day the Jews of that day the, the scholarly Jews the rabbis the the priests the the judges they missed the fact that the Messiah that they were looking for was going to have to come and suffer. We look back and we see how the, uh, Isaiah 53 fits jointly with the Gospels narrative of Jesus being crucified. Of different places in Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and, and other places where it talks about, in Hosea and Amos, where it talks about the... Uh, and Micah, where it talks about the things that are going to happen to bring about the Messiah, where he would be born, uh, how he would be wrapped and placed, how he would die, that he would be pierced, uh, that he'd be whipped and wounded, how he would live, and how he how he would himself, where he'd be born and where he'd be called from, 
and that he would be called out of Egypt when he hadn't been born in Egypt. And all of these things, all of these prophecies, they were like 350, 60 some prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his life, or birth, life, death, and resurrection. And I forget that how many, uh, one to the million, it's a huge, huge number of, of uh, statistics on one person fulfilling eight prophecies. One, for Jesus to have fulfilled eight of the prophecies, it was like one to a uh, hundred million or something like that. It was a huge, huge number. He didn't just fulfill eight. He fulfilled like 360 different prophecies. In that, some of those had to do with things he had no uh, way to, to make it happen. He had no way to, to make happen where he was born. His parents weren't living in that city. They were forced to go to that city by the government that was in power. Uh, how that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Okay, you could say Mary had read this or heard it, and, and hey, this would be neat. You know, he, he's the Savior, so we're going to wrap him like this, and we're going we're to fulfill these scriptures. Okay, but what about being pierced? You say, oh, that was when he had the nails put in his hands. No, that was that was bound, nailed. He was pierced in his side. That was a Roman soldier that didn't have any orders to do so, but they were supposed to break his legs. But huh, this guy already swooned. He didn't get in trouble for, for verifying he was dead. He ran his spear up into him. And blood and water flowed out, which was also a prophecy. And also... There's so much that Jesus had no way of knowing. He's dead on the cross, and they laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was They had to get him in the tomb quickly before the sun went down, instead of taking the time to get him wherever they figured they might bury him. They put him in a borrowed tomb that had not been used. All of these are prophecies of things that would happen. And Jesus said all of the things that must happen to the Christ had to be fulfilled, which were written in entirety of the Tanakh, which was the Torah and all the rest of what we call the Old Testament. And so he opened up the mind of the of the disciples to teach them and show them these things so that they understood. Okay. Now, we're going to take a little bit of a history lesson because you need to understand why... Uh, Shavuot, what did that play in this? We, we talked previously about the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the crucifixion and, and Passover and, and different things like that in other messages. But what about Shavuot? That's going to be like the 28th of May. So we're still about 30 days, a month out. So if we were living in the day of Jesus, he would still be on this earth for another 20 days before he ascended. This would be time to learn. And so I, I felt like what happened between those times of Jesus resurrecting and the next thing on God's calendar, what happened? Jesus was with them. He fellowshiped with them. He taught them. He, he opened their mind. Can you imagine the Sunday school lesson? Mind blown. The Lord just says this and this and this. And so these were Jewish men that had been raised up in synagogue. They had... They'd gone through Bar Mitzvah where they had to, to speak the Torah. They had to, to recite it. They knew what they knew. When Jesus said, this and this and this was said of me, and here and here and here is how it was fulfilled. And they realized that they were part of it because Jesus ended his discourse with them when he said, Repentance from mission of century preached in all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Witnesses of what? The things that happened to Jesus that were written in the Word that were supposed to happen, had to happen, had to be fulfilled. They realized they had front row seats. So backing up just a little bit, the history of the Exodus when they came out of Egypt, 
It had been prophesied 430 years ahead of time to Abraham that they were that God was going to take them out 430 years later. They came out through the day. They came out the day after Passover. Think of this, in Jesus' time. He was killed on Passover. Those that participated still went and had Passover. They just had this man killed, along with others, had this man killed, the man Jesus, and then they went and sat down and had Passover, reflecting on the deliverance from all the evil and their sin and everything in the past, and they had just crucified the Lamb of God on the same day. The day after is called the uh, the day of unleavened feast of unleavened bread. This was as the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt. They had to grab the bread that hadn't risen yet and take it with them. And so the the feast of unleavened bread was another feast right after the day of Passover. Jesus was in the grave. He was not risen. He was pierced, just like the matzah. He was striped with the stripes, just like the matzah. You get into the Seder meal, the, the Passover meal, and you go through all this. These things are part of that. They looked on him who was pierced, and they hold up the matzah, and they talk about the pierced, and talk about the stripes, because it's in the matzah. It's in the, it's in the Seder meal. It's in the scriptures. And these are things they were told to do all the way back there in Egypt. So the first day out of Egypt was an unleavened bread day. They, they, they were on the road. They were traveling. They hadn't got to the Red Sea yet. And all they had was what they could carry with them and eat. The only bread they had to eat was this unleavened bread, this matzah. In Exodus 19, you read about how that it took them three months to get to the plain of sin, and it was called, and to Mount Sinai. Three months, the, the three-month time frame, the 50 days, would be about the same time. They got to Mount Sinai, and that's where the next thing happened, where Moses went up on the mountain, and came down with the tablets, and came down with the rest of the, uh, the Torah. God transmitted it to him, transcribed it to him, and Moses wrote it down, and came and read it to the people. So the, the, the Exodus, they went through the Red Sea, they went all the way up to uh, Mount Sinai, they camped there, and that's where God gave the, the Torah. That is the same day that we celebrate as Pentecost. Shavuot is that festival. And Shavuot is described in Leviticus 23, if you want to look that up. It's celebrated every year since then. Still celebrated today. It's 50 days from Passover. Now, without trying to turn this into a Jewish congregation, just let me give a little bit of background here. The significance of the Jewish things between Passover and Shavuot helped put a spotlight on the things that affect Christ. As we said, the scripture all had to be fulfilled. <clears throat> so Passover was the, the same as Jesus' crucifixion. He was the Lamb of God. He died for the sins of the world. Uh, I don't want to go into it right now, but even the way the lambs were, were laid out and had to be you know, uh, opened up you know, before the fire to be roasted it looked like someone on a cross. Just understand that it was it was very descriptive. They were the, the way these things look. Going from from there, the next day was the feast of unleavened bread. As I said, Jesus was in the grave. He wasn't risen. And then the day after that was was not a, a festival holy day that they couldn't work. As a matter of fact, on the the second day from Passover. What they would do is go out into the barley fields. That was the first crops to ripen. They'd go out in the barley fields and they would take ribbons. And the, before Passover, they'd take ribbons and they'd tie up the bundles of grain, not cut them, still standing in the field. They would tie up the ones that were about to be ripe 
so that on this day of Omar, Omar was a, a, a measure, kind of like a quart or a half gallon. It was a, a size, like saying, hey, they took a quart of grain. Okay? The biblical measure was called an Omar. So on this day of Omar, it was actually called uh, Korban Omar, which meant holy. Uh, so here, here they go out there in the field before Passover, and they tie off these grains with ribbon, and then they would come back on this day between Passover and that next Sunday. They, they would come back, and they would cut those grains, come back in, and take those and beat them until the grain heads came off the threshing. They would beat them. And uh, they're at the temple floor, they beat them, and then the wind blow away whatever chaff there was. They would take that seeds that was left, and they would go and they would grind it, grind it into a powder. And then they would put it through, I think it was 13 different sifters, different size screens, until it was a very, very fine powder. They kept grinding it until it would go, only go through that very fine powder. And they would gather up an omar of this fine flour. And they would take it to the, the, the temple and take a handful and kind of pour it out on the edge of the altar. And then the priest would take that fine flour, the priest in the temple would then eat that fine flour. The significance here is that uh, they weren't able, weren't allowed to bring grain offerings to the temple, even though there was the harvest. This was the only offering of grain at this point. And I'll tell you more about that here in a little bit. So this was the first fruits of the field, first fruits of any harvest was done this way and brought to the Lord, poured out on the altar, and the priest partook of it. Jesus was poured out on the altar of sacrifice for our sins. And what did he do? He spent time with the disciples. They got to feast on the bread of life all through these 40 days that he stayed with them. The church, the believers, the true believers got to feast on Jesus and his intimate knowledge of, of everything that they needed to know. After that, the, the sun, there was a Sabbath in there, the, the Saturday, Friday to Saturday. And then there was the, the Sunday where Jesus rose, the resurrection. That was the Feast of First Fruits. So Passover, unleavened bread, the uh, Korban Hamar, then the regular Sabbath, and then after that, the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus raised on First Fruits. Jesus is called the firstborn of many brethren. He rose from the dead to prove to us that we have everlasting life. Amen. He has his resurrected body. Once we die, we will still wait for ours. The time that the Israelites went from Egypt to Mount Sinai is reflected in the 50 days where they would go and count throughout those 50 days. How many days from Omar? How many days counting from that day of Omar? Let me read this out of Shabbat.org. Shabbat 2023, a two-day holiday celebrated from sunset May 25th, 2023 until mid-nightfall on May 27th, 2023, coincides with the date that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai more than 3,000 years ago. It comes after 49 days of eager counting as we prepared ourselves for this special day. It is celebrated by lighting candles, staying up all night to learn Torah, hearing and reading the Ten Commandments in synagogue, feasting on dairy foods, and more. And then they go on to say, The Torah commands us to count 50 days from the day we brought the Omar, and on the 50th day another grain offering was brought. So this was on Shavuot that another grain offering was brought. However, unlike the one brought on the second day of Passover, this offering, known as the, uh, I cannot, cannot pronounce this in Hebrew, so I'm going to do my best, 
S H T E I Shate Halakem, which means two loaves. It was brought from the new wheat, what was just harvested during that 50 days. They would make bread from that, harvested from the new wheat, although the grains from the new crop had been allowed for personal consumption, all the barley harvest and anything that had been harvested in, in that 50 days from the wheat harvest since the Omar offering, they would not use any of the new grain for temple offerings until this second offering of the two loaves was offered up in the temple. They had to wait to be able to bring any more offerings of grain until after these two loaves were offered on this particular day. As the verse states, you shall count for yourselves from the day you bring the Omar as a wave of offering seven weeks. You shall count until the day of the seventh week, namely the fiftieth day, on which you shall bring a new meal offering to the Lord. And so, see, they were given these prescriptions of how to do this. But if you look at it, we see Jesus rose from the dead. He spent time with the disciples. He spent time here doing things to get the word deeply within them. And then once the two low they had, they, they had to wait they had to keep looking forward to keep anticipating this date 50 years out 50 days out so they could give these two loaves and then they could bring the grain offerings that were prescribed why would god do stuff like that why wouldn't he say look you see that offerings bring them i'll take them every day bring them every day he was trying to teach them spiritual lessons and when we look at them in light of Christ and in light of the church and in light of history we see how God actually played out and said this is what I want to do this is this is you are doing a dress rehearsal for things that are going to be fulfilled later so there are a lot of things that were going on in Israel from Passover to Shavuot we think of the rehearsal as the only thing. See, God provides us many spiritual truths in the various Jewish feasts and mandated activities. He's not telling us that we have to do those activities, but when we look at them in the light of hindsight, in light of Scripture, and in light of what they were asked to do and what that actually portrayed, even though they were too close to it and doing it out of obligation, we look back and see how they did it year after year after year. And it's painting a spiritual message about what Christ was going to do and do with the church. It's for our learning that these things are written. It's for our belief and for our faith. So these were all dress rehearsals of spiritual truths. When we see them with spiritual eyes, we begin to see how God understands man and the ways of man. And he's trying to show us that he's in charge, he's still in control, and that He's still with us. He loves our worship. He prescribes how to worship. And going back to Luke chapter 24, verse 44, then he said to them, These are the words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the laws of Moses, and the prophets, and Psalms concerning me. Just like the early church. They were waiting for something. Because the Lord promised them to wait until something happens. Stay in Jerusalem until the gift of the Father is given to you. They weren't told you wait there until Shavuot. They weren't given an end date. They weren't told what they were supposed to receive. Just when it comes, you'll know it. You'll, you'll, see, you'll understand it more when it happens. But here's where you go. You go there and you tarry there. Just go and spend time praying. Spend time seeking the Father's face. And they did. Now it's said by church, early church fathers that when Jesus ascended on that hill... And was seen, he was he ascended in the presence of five hundred or so people. 
And we know from scripture that when the church came out of the upper room on Pentecost, it says the 120. Some of them got tired of waiting. Some of them said, you know what? We've had, we, we spent time with Jesus, that's good enough. Y'all go on, we're gonna, we're gonna wait and read it in the news. We'll come see you once you start your, your uh, big church gatherings. Jesus said, wait, there's something getting ready to happen. And I want you to be prepared. Spend time praying about it, but I want you to be prepared. Something's going to happen. The children of Israel, all those years, had to wait until Shavuot to bring that other grain offering. The disciples were told to wait, and it happened on the same day that something happened, and their waiting ended. The same with the children of Israel bringing the grain offerings. Their waiting ended. We're still looking for something in the church. It hasn't happened yet. It's in Scripture, and Jesus tells us to wait. The way we're watched today, we're watching and waiting for the return of the Lord in the rapture. First Corinthians chapter 15, starting verse 51, says, "Behold, I tell you a mystery: we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye." At the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. As a believer, we know if we go by way of the grave that we will be one of those that's listening for the trumpet to sound so that we will be raised and changed into our incorruptible body, into our glorified body. If we're still here when that trumpet sounds, that we, as believers, will be changed and we'll meet them in the air and we'll go with Christ and be forever with Him. We're still waiting for that. God didn't tell us how long to wait. He didn't tell us really what it's going to look like when it happens. He just said, go, tarry, wait, be witnesses for me. The same message that was given to the first apostles, the same message given to the early church, has not changed because Jesus has not come back yet. We are still living in the New Testament times. You and I are writing the New Testament second book of Acts, so to speak. The things that we're doing are portraying the things that God wants done by the believers in this world. He says, watch and wait. He says, occupy until I come know that where you where I am you will be also John 14 I go to prepare a place for you where I am you may be also and then I'll come and gather you back to me we're still looking forward to that those that are still here those that have all gone to sleep in the Lord their bodies are waiting for that day they're already in the spirit with the Lord today We need to watch, we need to wait, we need to tarry, and we need to look forward in anticipation. Looking forward to that wedding supper of the Lamb in heaven. Amen. There may be people watching today that have never asked Jesus Christ into their heart as Lord and Savior. You say, I don't know that I would be one that went if Jesus came back. Well, it's not if he comes back, it's when he comes back. And you're right. If you don't know, you need to make that sure. It's very simple. Jesus did all the work. He just asks us to accept his free gift. We can't make ourselves right. We can't clean ourselves up. We can't even clean ourselves up after the fact. It's all him. It's all his grace. As we fall more and more in love with him we want to be more and more like him and we want to please him more and more but it's not the 11th, 12th and 13th commandments that we have to start doing it's not a have to as my dad always said it's a get to we get to become better why? because we love him and we want to 
If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to give you that opportunity to, to ask him into your life. Romans chapter 10 says, If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. I must say a prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray this with me. I'll pause in between. If you believe the words that I'm saying, if you believe what I'm saying when I'm praying, say it believing in your heart. Truly asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Truly asking him to become your Savior and truly accepting his free gift. So all we can do is accept it by faith. Let us pray. Dear God, I realize that I'm a sinner. And I realize I've tried to do this on my own. I know that I can't do it. I believe that Jesus lived and died for me. And I believe that you raised him from the dead, Father. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I accept the free gift of salvation through Jesus. And I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, praise God. As I had one person ask me, he was a fire victim, and I was at the hospital talking with him, praying with him. And he prayed that prayer, and he says, does this mean I'm saved? I said, yes, it does. Same with you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, now tell somebody. If you have a pastor that you haven't talked to in a while, that they believe and preach in salvation, tell them. If you have a family member that's a Christian that's talked to you about Jesus before and you've shut them off, tell them. Or if you don't have anybody else to tell, tell me. You can send it in a private message to my Facebook. You can put it into the, the, the comments on YouTube. You can send me an email at contact us at fgfellowship.org. I'd love to hear from you that you accepted Jesus, you prayed that prayer, because I want to pray with you even after that. Amen? Amen. Each week we end our, uh, our message with the ironic blessing. Before I share this, I want to say that I just saw a deal on Facebook today, a video, a short this guy in Israel said that they found a locket in Israel in one of the digs. And at first they thought it was just blank inside. And then they got to looking at it and they saw some, it seemed to be marking, so started cleaning the metal, started cleaning the, the debris. And it's just a little piece. And they started realizing that the markings started becoming letters, started showing up as letters. And they started realizing that these letters started becoming words. And then they realized it was this ironic blessing in Hebrew written on that locket. Amen. And it's 600 years older than what they found in the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is... From the Word of God, Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26, found inscribed into this metal on this locket that is the oldest piece of scripture found in the land of Israel. And it was on a locket. It may have been on a priest. It may have been a blessing given to somebody. We don't know. But the antiquities in Israel has it now as a, as a keepsake in Israel, a national treasure. God gave these words to Moses and told Moses that when Aaron and his sons say these over the people, I will put my name on them. Amen. That's how special this blessing is. It's still said today in, in temple and in, in, in uh, synagogue. They say it at the end of every gathering and meeting. We say it in ours 
because we want God to put his name on us. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and the Lord give you peace. Go in peace. God bless and have a beautiful day. This is Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship.